Mephibosheth comes before David, and we see that he falls on his face um, in fear before David. He probably hears from Ziba, hey, David wants to show you kindness, but there's still anxiousness, there's still fear. And the reason is, is because historically there's this custom of bloodletting when um, kings would overtake the throne. And what that meant was that in, um, when a new king were to take the throne, anyone that was associated to the old king, a family, or connected in some way, um, they would kill because it would be a threat to the throne. In fact, this was considered something that was politically sharp. It was a smart move. And it was just so, you know, that the new king would take the throne. He would have no problems, um, no one kind of challenging his position, um, challenging his authority. So that w- it would have been, it would have looked like, yep, that's what you do. And Mephibosheth knew that. He knew that his life was in danger. However, we see that instead of killing Mephibosheth, David actually does the exact opposite. He spares his life. But not only that, I mean, if he would have spared Mephibosheth's life, that would have been incredible. But he goes above and beyond. He um, redeems him Saul's land. He says he gives him all this land. And not only that, he gives him Ziba and his servants, which equal 35, his sons and his servants, to serve Mephibosheth for the rest of his life. So he's taken care of. He's, his life is spared. He's taken care of. Um, he has plenty of food, plenty of people to take care of him since he's crippled. He can't take care of himself. And not only that, David promises that he will eat at his table and be treated like one of his sons for the rest of his life. So we just see this overwhelming (coughs) compassion and care that David shows Mephibosheth. And this word kindness, the Hebrew word for it is actually hesed. And, you know, we think of someone, we say, oh, someone's kind. You know, we think of... um, Oh, they're they're really sweet. Well, this word hesed actually means a steadfast love. It's this love, loyalty marked with faithfulness, compassion, and care. And that's exactly what David shows Mephibosheth as he treats him. And in the same way, we're pointed to God. You know how David, the king, the ideal king, showed um, compassion and care for Mephibosheth. We're also shown compassion and care from the Lord. He represents Israel's ideal king. Christ represents our perfect king. And I I love that part of it, how it just exactly reflects God's love, his kindness. In fact, in the Old Testament and all throughout, when it says God's kind, whatever it says is steadfast love, that same word hesed is used for God when when it speaks about our relationship with him. And so it's a direct connection. The, the story wraps up, and we see that, you know, this, this guy who came from Lodabar, he was crippled, actually no hope. Um, he ends with having land, living in Jerusalem, being served by Ziba, um, and eating at the king's table. And so we see this guy who was a hopeless cripple from Lodabar. He is now a redeemed cripple um, with his identity being treated as one of the king's son. And we just see this dramatic change in his life. And I know that in the story, I had mentioned that, you know, um, God's steadfast love for us, it's it's a direct correlation to our lives. And the same way, the story reminds me of God's kindness, his steadfast love in my own life. And I think the story just mirrors our relationship with God. You know, in the same way through Christ, as David redeemed Mephibosheth's life, as he showed compassion and care, as as he saved his life, so too has Christ saved my life. Um, so too has he worked in my life, has he, he's redeemed my life, he's restored my life. Um, in the same way that um, David essentially adopted Mephibosheth as one of his sons, so too have us who've, who've accepted Christ in our life have been adopted into God's family, we're God's children. And I love that part of the story, and it's in that that I can have just tremendous hope that Jesus is my hope, no matter what circumstance in my life happens, no matter how I sin or um, what brokenness I face. And I love just Jesus is our hope because it's through him we are adopted, we're accepted, we're provided for, and we are loved by our God. But even in the story, I think of, um, I, I, you know, I was saying the story, and I think of, the, you know, but in Mephibosheth's life, like, there's things in my life that relate to Mephibosheth's physical state of being broken and of being crippled. You know, though Mephibosheth was restored, and though I know as a believer I'm restored and I'm redeemed, there's things in my life still that I can tend to go back to and actually operate as if, you know, I'm, you know, back in Lodabar, um, back as Mephibosheth as he was before. And I think in our, in our, all of our whole life, we can all see 
um, these reflections of brokenness in our life and these reflections of not going to the Lord um, for those of us who believe in God and who've professed our faith in Christ, going to him first above, above anything else. And so I ask myself, you know, why don't I embrace God's love in my life at times? Why don't I embrace his um, redemption? Um, why don't I place my hope in Christ rather than in things that ultimately will fail me every time? And so there's three reasons um, from even the story of Mephibosheth that I found of reasons why I don't run to Christ and embrace um, his love and his kindness um, first and foremost in my life. And the first reason, maybe you guys can relate, is that I can start to believe that there's fear in coming to God with my sin and with things that are broken in my life. Um, can you guys relate to that? Are there things in your life where you're like, wow, this just seems, whether it's in your past or even now, it just seems so beyond repair. Um, whether it's sin in your life or maybe circumstances um, with family or with friends or school or anything that just seem, they're just broken. And you're like, how is there hope in this? I think for me, you know, I can have a tendency to go back as if I'm still living in Lodabar. And I think it would be crazy, right, if Mephibosheth, after all that King David had said and had done, if Mephibosheth said, you know, thank you so much, King David, but I'm just going to go back to Lodabar. Um, uh, I'm more comfortable there. And I bet, you know, Lodabar was a desolate place, a broken place. I'm sure in Lodabar, Mephibosheth felt initially more comfortable. He felt like he belonged there. He fit in there. And he didn't probably feel as exposed in Lodabar as he felt exposed standing in front of this king. And I think in the same way, you know, we're not as, ex you know, we're exposed standing in front of our perfect king. But we're told in Hebrews that we can have confidence in approaching the throne of Christ because he is a God who has compassion on us, who loves us. That it doesn't matter our brokenness or our sin because we're not justified by that. We're justified by Christ alone. And I love that promise. I think I have to go back to that all the time when I can fall into starting to believe um, that, you know, there's fear in coming to God. There's no fear. Uh, in 1 John 4.18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And I love that it's in the cross that we've been perfected in love. You know, I love that um, it's in the cross where we have full love, full acceptance, um, that we can approach God with confidence, knowing that he, he cares for us, he loves us, and that he himself redeems us alone. So even where, you know, is there fear in your life? Where is there fear that's preventing you from coming before God, coming before Christ and running to him alone? <coughs> the second reason I see in Mephibosheth's story, where sometimes I don't run to Christ and embrace his loving kindness and his grace in my life, is because sometimes I can tend to believe or start to believe that godly growth is up to me. Have you guys ever, when you were growing up, had the gold stars in elementary school? Where every time you did something nice, whether it's, you know, cared for a friend or you served, helped the teacher, you got a gold star. Maybe you got an A in that test, you got a gold star. Well, there's that chart with a gold star. But there's also, do you guys remember the blackboard or maybe in your case the whiteboard where your name went when you did something wrong and you got a check or a slash? Yeah, I remember that very well. And so you like, it's like right next to like this beautiful gold star chart was your name with check marks, right? And I went to a private school um, when I was really young, and you got a check mark for everything. I mean, I dropped my pencil one time, and I got a check mark. Um, and so, <laughs> and so um, you know, I feel like sometimes in my life there's a battle between the stars and the slashes. You know, sometimes I can think like, okay, yep did well, you know, I read the Bible, spent time with the Lord, um, I was patient with this person, or even like I did well on this job, I got the A on this class, um, I got the A in this test, and it being a battle because there's also the other side of like, oh, you know, I did this wrong, oh man, I totally snapped at my roommate, or oh, I just fell again in this sin I've been struggling with over and over again, or even brokenness in our life that you have no control over. Sometimes I think we're in a battle of the stars and slashes. But I think I'm reminded that, you know, no matter how hard I try, I can't produce genuine change in my own life. Um, and all this leads to the stars and slashes is a life of defeat, defeat and frustration. Um, you know, I can, I can always look to the gold star chart. 
Um, but I'll always be reminded of the slashes on that blackboard. And I think in our life as believers, we can tend to justify ourselves by the good we do, but we're never justified by that, as Mephibosheth wasn't justified as well.